notwithstanding that, there were times in the two years, well, let's see, this is uh, uh, 72, and it wasn't until two years later that, uh, that Richard Nixon resigned. There were a lot of times during those two years when there seemed to be significant disagreement in the Post newsroom about the importance of this story, and you had to basically push it forward uphill. Yes, well, uh, well there were elements in the Post, uh, uh, namely the National Desk, who normally would do this story, right? This was not our, this, this shouldn't be our way. Let's get, this is national politics. But we, we grabbed it and we held it. And we were allowed to handle it because we kept on finding things out almost day by day by day. And, but the national desk kept on saying, well, this is all that. They all do dirty tricks. They all do this. They all do that. Well, we didn't know who did dirty tricks. We didn't know that know anything about it. And by the time we found out the dirty tricks that the Democrats did under, under the famous Dick Tuck, who I didn't even know about, it was child's play compared to what the Nixons were doing. And, and they, they said, well, and then when they said, well, then, then, well, you can't handle the story. You don't have the background. True, we didn't have the background. Because we didn't have the background, our reporters, especially Woodward and Bernstein, but not only them, the other people did too, went out and talked to low-level people, secretaries and assistants and, and, and deputies and whatnot, and uh, day and night, night and day and weekends, and got them piece, pieces together, got them to talk when they didn't want to talk. That's why we had so many unnamed sources in our story. If we named them, the Nixons would have nailed them. It would have been the end of the story. And when they were at that point, they said, well, we should take it over. Bradley said, look, we need more experienced reporters on this. I said, look, it was just a very inexperienced that, that drove us to get the facts dug out. Why do you want to change a winning game? And he, and he they never said another word to me. I do know that my opposite number, the national editor, constantly was trying to undermine my presentation of the stories. And I, I wasn't the only one that noted it. I didn't resent it. I remembered at the Herald Tribune, that was par for the course. You did that. I don't care about that. But other people on the staff noticed it and, and kept on telling me, he's trying, to get, you know, he's trying to dig your grave. Well, we held on through the investigation. And it was Metro Stories for all of 1973. But with the end of 1973, it gradually but steadily became more and more the national staff story. And I did that, I mean, I could see it by the, by the, pa the page one uh, head count, how many stories from Metro, how many stories from national. Well, now it expanded it. It made it related things with, uh, with ITT. With, with Robert Vesco, with, with Howard Hughes, with, the, with this committee, with the Judicial Committee, with the uh, other committee. It was naturally a, and I recognized this, and it was proper for them to play that role. We continue to play a role, especially uh, Bernstein and Woodward, and, and especially the people that covered the Watergate hearings and that covered the trial. They, they were Metro reporters, and they did an astonishingly good job. Uh, but basically, it turned into a, into a national story, which is fine and proper, as it should be. There is a point. You talked earlier about how Ben Bradley was getting a lot of pressure from his lawyer friend, Edward Bennett Williams, and from others in his social circle. You write at one point, Ben was beginning to burn, uh, I think, because of that, right? Yes. He was getting a lot of pressure. Yeah. That, what well, he's it? accustomed to, to, to uh, people who have been singed complaining. That's, you know, that's nothing that's going to upset him. Uh, uh, it's when the friends complain. That's, that's what gets to him. And so he craved. He craved. And they, they complained about all these anonymous people. Give us a name, for God's sakes. They weren't anonymous to us. We knew who they were. Except for... Well, one. There was one glaring exception. <laughs> I'll get to that in a second. <laughs> well, go ahead. And he Tell said, I, you know, and he really pressed us to get names in the paper. God damn name, get one in there. And we did this with what I consider the most important story 
that we did during Watergate. We had reported on a slush fund that, that uh, sustained the dirty trick campaign of the Nixon administration throughout the years, throughout the country. And we had identified that we knew there were five people. We had identified one, two, three, four. And we knew the fourth one, the fifth one, was a high White House person, but we didn't know who. And we pressed and we pressed. And we thought we had three sources. This was Woodstein. Three sources that told us that the fifth man was Bob Balderman, who was the president's chief of staff. Now, if the president's chief of staff knows this, then the president knows. Because the role of a chief of staff is to tell the president everything he knows. And if he doesn't do that, he's no longer a chief of staff. He's got to go. So if you name Haldeman, you're really naming Nixon. Now, this is what you do very, very carefully. And you want to be sure you're right. Because if we're wrong, the whole thing collapses. The paper's reputation is destroyed. The public turns against you. And I lose my job. <laughs> the mistake was that in the pressure to get this, they were interviewing Hugh Sloan, who had been the finance ch chairman of the committee to re-elect the president, and was a decent man. He was a Nixon acolyte. I admired him very much. He had left, though, because the shenanigans had gotten a little bit beyond his tolerance level. And he wanted to be seen by the reporters as a decent man. He also did not want to be a snitch. He wanted to remain loyal to his president. And so they're having this, what I have to say was a little elliptical, in hindsight, conversation where they are approaching it with one point of view. And, the, and Sloan is talking from another point of view, and they're not quite, they're not direct with each other. And so they think with the other two guys that they have it that not only was Haldeman the fifth man, this was also testified to the grand jury by Hugh Sloan. They understood Hugh Sloan to say that he had told that to the grand jury. Well, this was a good source, right? Hugh Sloan to the grand jury, told to the grand jury. We print the story. Oh, it was such a dicey story. We had been working on it for weeks and going back and forth, back and forth, and hitting the air pocket when we had to decide whether to go or not to go, which was always past deadline. Air pocket was Bradley's term. And here we were again on this biggest, my opinion, story. And as I'm listening, I, I was a very tough questioner. When Sussman and the reporters came to me, I, I, I worked them thoroughly. I mean, I worked who, what, where, when, why, you know. Hus Sussman, who was Harry's deputy, said, Harry asked for proof on every paragraph. I just want to throw that in. This is what he's going through here. And, 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 and I was satisfied with the story. And I bring it to. Uh, to um, Bradley and Simons and, and Paul with the National Letter said, this is freaking action. And boy, they have questions that I haven't even thought of, which embarrassed me. And I hear, with every question, Woodstein provides a fuller explanation that seems more or less rational. But by this time, and we're rewriting and leaving, we're rewriting and leaving. And finally, I'm standing there, Woodbush is typing up, finally, we're way past the line. And I said, look, why don't you try this? Why don't you say when you leave that Haldeman is the fifth man? We have this from three sources. We have from one source, but the direct source, right, who said that he told me to the grand jury. So as I'm saying this, and we have been discussing this now for, for at least an hour and a half, Bradley, really pissed off, walks out of his office. There's a big conveyor belt separating the newsroom where the copy flowed from the uh, copy desk to the night desk. And he 
he stops at that barrier, he doesn't come across, I'm on the other side, and leaning over Woodward saying this, why don't you try that? And he says, thank you very much, Roosevelt. We will go with what we have. We're going home. He was very angry. Next morning, Hugh Sloan is going with his lawyer to a court hearing. And he's asked by a CBS reporter whether he had testified to this to the grand jury. And Sloan would not speak, but his lawyer did. And he said, Hugh Sloan has never testified to the grand jury to this effect. That is what is known as hitting the fan. <laughs> and I, I was beside myself and I was trying to figure out what went wrong and how it could have been wrong and that this thing would bring down the whole enterprise and maybe damage the post irreparably. And I was trying to find what Steve could have done. There's no way that does. They have no clue. They were, with their publisher to be, talking about the book to be. <laughs> These were very self-possessed young men. And finally they made contact and they got over and we visited their sources and it became fairly clear that we should, Howard Simon's the managing editor one of us, retract the media, because everybody was after him. What are we going to say? I beg Rob, please do not retract until we know what, what went wrong here. And Bradley stood with me and he simply said we stand by the sword. And Howard was very unhappy with that. He thought that was not the honorable thing to do. And we just worked out a week as hard as we could. And very early on, the lawyer for Sloan indicated that the fifth man part was true, that Sloan did not testify to the grand jury because the government the prosecutors did not ask him the question. Had he been asked the question, he would have. Well, the lawyer didn't say that. He simply said he had not been asked. And we found out from other people, and here is where we go. The one source I remained ignorant of, Wolfie, came through because she said this was a hold of an operation. And that really committed us to go that Sunday with a story that said we made a terrible mistake. Sloan did not testify. He wasn't asked, but he was the fifth man. So we made a mistake. It was a bad mistake. We shouldn't have made it. It was a failure of journalistic techniques. Even when you were on high alert not to make this kind of mistake, you made it anyway. Out of lust, you know, you want to get that story in the paper. And, and, uh, and, and well, it, journalism is an endless tutorial. You learn something new every time. You <laughs> never know enough, and you never cannot learn enough. When Richard Nixon resigned, uh, it was just a few days after the smoking gun tape came out in the summer of 74. There was a tape that was made six days after the burglary that showed that the president knew and endorsed the cover. The smoking gun tape comes out, Nixon resigns. You write uh, that there was no gloating in the Washington Post newsroom. I would have thought that at that point there would have been some uh, justifiable statements to the effect that we were right all along. We were right. It was very important for us not to go. Because the Republicans had charged all along that we were the handmaidens of the Democratic Party seeking to uh, overturn the Republican administration. It was important, really, that we were not partisan. And, and, and how self-image was that we were not partisan. And, and uh, so it became really important to be professional about it and just to take it in stride. And I'm happy to say that the newsroom fulfilled Rodney's expectations of us to the right. We're going to slip over a little bit because in the interest of time, and I want to give people here a couple of, uh, an opportunity to ask a couple of questions, but I want to slip into uh, a point where you did, uh, there was a time when you ran the, the Washington Post book world, the commentary section, uh, 
there was some time that you ran the national desk at uh, about 18 months. Um, then at uh, age 50, you stepped away from large newspapers and huge metropolitan areas. And tell us what you think about what you were thinking about when you came to a smaller city. Well, I came to, uh, to Albany. Uh, I was recruited to come here. When the invitation came, I knew I wasn't going to Albany, but I might as well take a look, right? Uh, Albany was the uh, place where the New York Central made a sharp left turn to take me to Syracuse. <laughs> uh, and uh, I came and I met the publisher, Roger Greer. There's a Roger Greer friend in the audience, I'm very happy to say. And I liked Roger very much. And I saw he was the kind of man that I could work for happily. I also studied the papers for a couple of days. And I saw they needed help. <laughs> and I saw that I had the skills to provide them. And it was my opportunity. I was never going to be the managing editor of the Washington Post. I was certainly not going to be the executive editor of the Washington Post. And I wanted to run my own shop. I had been a department head for 12 years. And I really yearned to put into practice the thing that I had learned through bitter experience over the years from clerk's job to a typist's job to all the things that one accumulates in, in one's bones from these, this exposure and, and put them into effect where you're the guy that gives the ulcers instead of the guy that picks the ulcers. <laughs> and, and, and how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I thought Albany was a good place to do it, and I have never made a wiser decision in Albany. Well, I want to retract what I wrote and write a question in the world. If there's a second edition, hey, can I do a second edition? Can I do a quick rewrite? <laughs> Let's do a, I'll, I'll come back. No, 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 in all candor, I am happy to say that my proudest achievement by far has been that despite her strong opposition, I was able to win the hand of Anne Hahn as my wife. Uh, we'll come back in a, I have just a little bit at the end, but I do want to take a couple questions from the floor. We are actually over time here. We missed the deadline, but let me just take a, a couple of questions here from uh, if anybody has something you'd like to ask here. Yep. Oh, yes, I'm sorry, there is a microphone. Come down here with this so that we can get you uh, recorded. I'm curious what you consider your greatest achievement here in Albany. I think we uh, took papers that had once had a very proud tradition of taking on the political structure, but I'd give you that sort of uh, The knees had weakened, and that's why I was hired in order to infuse the papers with back, uh, professional backbone. And my proudest achievement was that over time, and only, not only happily, I was able to convert people who were accustomed to working on the one sort of indifferent system of standards to a higher system, and that they responded, that they were there, they had the talent, they had the ability, they did not have the leadership. Now they have the leadership. I was also able to hire really outstanding, good people, and I paid an enormous amount of attention to the people that I hired. And we, we, we put them through the ringer because we wanted to be as sure as we could that we were making the proper decision. That is not to say that we always made the right decision. We had our failures, but we had overwhelmingly our successes. 
And, and these people really helped bring up the quality of the paper. We achieved the circulation level that this Times Union had never seen. And, and, and we, used to, we had a, a staff that covered the area in a way that it had never been covered. And with an intensity and with a standard that I think still persists, especially in state coverage and investigative coverage. Although economic punishment has forced retraction on all newspapers, all newspapers. Uh, that would be my promise to you. You know, there's a way in which uh, Bob Woodward and I share something. We, uh, we both passed on this the first time we applied. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, Eric. Wait a second. Wait a second. Uh, that, may be, that may be factual. But the second time you applied, I can't say that I was decisive, but I was asked. And I recommended you to be managing. Ah, thank you. You're <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Over here, yes. Uh, hold on just a second. He'll hand you the microphone. Mr. Rosenfeld, you've seen journalism develop over the past um, approximately five decades. What do you think is the future of journalism for the next decade or so? Good question. I don't know what it will be. I can tell you what I hope it will be. That whatever modality, whatever form it will be transmitted in, whether it is in print or not in print, that the qualities that make for a good, the essential qualities that make for a good, respectable print newspaper make for respectable whatever kind of paper it is. In other words, hard reporting, factual reporting, not from a point of view, but what are the facts? Can you discern them? Can you find them? Can you explore them? Is your vision far? Are you, are you ideologically fixated on one goal, on one mission? Journalism is an inclusive enterprise that is an essential ingredient of American democracy. You can argue it is the essential ingredient of any wanting to be a democracy. Because somebody's got to hold people to account. And in life, in truth, we, have, we live in a great country. But I don't trust government inspectors to inspect government. I don't trust government prosecutors to avidly prosecute government. We saw it in Watergate. Yes. They're human beings. You need a free press, a responsible, hard-working, hard-driving free press, nonpartisan, non-ideological. Truth is almost a religious concept. But try to get as much of the truth as you can get and put it in the paper. And the glory is we publish the paper every day. And we, make, and we don't get things right, totally right. Never. We're not perfect. But we have another chance the next day. And we have another chance the following day. And to keep our eye focused on that. And that, I would say, you should do that whatever tool you're using. And frankly, I, I, I don't see that. I'm not that well acquainted with it. I know some people do extremely good work. But I also see that it leaves the print media by the nose. So the print media now, it used to be that a newspaper story was reported. A reporter got an assignment, talked about it with the assignment editor, went out and reported, came back, talked about it with the assignment editor, had a further discussion, wrote it, assignment editor looked it over, maybe had questions, got some more things, went to a copy desk, copy desk looked it over. If they had questions more candidly, if it was a serious story of some magnitude, managing editor is involved, maybe even the editor is involved, right? If it's a series of some magnitude, damn well the editor is involved. Uh, and so, so many eyes looked at it. And it took at least 12 hours to do this. Well, nowadays, in split seconds, they're out with the blog, they're reporting. And everybody's running it. And so often, the facts are not the facts, they're opinions. The eyewitness is always the, the worst testimony. 
And, and it's, it's just, I mean, it's discombobulated journalism. We haven't learned how to cope with it. And there are voices in the wilderness, like myself, who keep on crying out. And of course, the people who listen most attentively are the people of my generation. The younger people, I don't know how much they listen. <laughs> yes, right down here in the front. Hi. Yes. To digress, there was a picture of you with Dustin Hoffman in the paper, the Times yeah. Union, and they mentioned a joke he was telling you and Ben Bradley. You want me to tell the joke? Well, <laughs> they said it was a dirty joke. Yes, so it I was don't a know dirty joke. I'm old enough you to hear, hear this. You want to hear the dirty joke? I would. <laughs> but I'm, kidding. I'm not going to tell you the dirty joke. <laughs> I just wondered if you remembered it. Yeah. I wish I said I could. It was very funny because I really laughed. I really laughed. Hoffman, when he came to, uh, you know, Hoffman and Redford showed up before Warden showed up. And when Hoffman came, he found out that one of my requirements as Metro Weather was that my male reporters, who came very underdressed to work, have at least a necktie in their desk drawer. So should they be sent out on a story that by my sensibilities would require a necktie. Not by their sensibilities, by mine. They, it would be available, and they couldn't say to me, I don't have a necktie. Uh, he found that out now. Dustin Hoffman came to Washington, and he didn't have a necktie. So he went out and bought a necktie and showed it to me with great pleasure. See, I have a necktie. <laughs> OK, bring the microphone back over here for Finley. This has to be the last question, given the time involved. I'm interested in the present, do, present day doings of Woodward and Bernstein. It seems to me they're very different personalities. Yeah. We have Woodward writing all these insider books, one after the other after the other, appearing on the talk shows, and I don't see much of Bernstein. I have a feeling that Bernstein is a bit of a, Bernstein, I guess he wants to be called, is a bit of a lightweight. But uh, I don't know if you want to talk about that, but... Uh, I would not. Quote, no, of uh, course not. Uh, uh, <laughs> Carl uh, had his problems, and if you read the book, they are detailed. Uh, but in Watergate, he pulled himself together, and he deserves every accolade. He shares in it equally. He's not the junior partner. And, and they did great work. And they deserve every plaudit that they have received. They earned it. And while he hasn't written as many books as, as Woodward, he's written books and worthy books. One very famous one on Hillary Clinton, another one on the Pope and Reagan. He was not playing in a sandbox. <laughs> he participates in panels. He shows up on Morning Joe. He's a very sagacious person. He's knowledgeable. He's steady. Um, he was a friend of Elizabeth Taylor's. Were you a friend of Elizabeth Taylor's? <laughs> you know, I think it's, it's worth noting that uh, we, we remember that the Washington Post won the Pulitzer Prize for its Watergate coverage. And it was not, in fact, Pulitzer Prize for Woodward and Bernstein. It was the Pulitzer Gold Medal which goes to the newspaper, which I think is appropriate given that it is the institution and the many individuals involved, <coughs> not just those bylined, who carried the responsibility for guiding us through the coverage of the most significant crime that we've seen in American political history. So it is a, a significant tribute to not just those two reporters, but to their editor, their editors, their heroic publisher during that time. Um, for some of us, uh, this was life-changing. Um, uh, I remember reading about the Watergate break-in. I was actually uh, in, in Europe, and I remember reading this little paragraph in the International Herald Tribune. Um, and someday you'll have to explain why you didn't move to Paris. He, he could have run the International Herald Tribune, which sounds like a great job, don't you think? Anyway, I remember reading about it and thinking what an interesting thing. And during those years, many of us recognized that journalism had the potential 
to really make a difference in this country, not uh, uh, in a way that uh, politics perhaps couldn't. If politics is the pursuit of power, journalism really at its best is the pursuit of truth. And so it turned some of us into journalists. And in that regard, I consider myself one of Harry's children. Uh, I am part of that generation of people who were inspired by Harry Rosenfeld and his ilk to turn to journalism. So it's a really special opportunity for me to come in and be a part of, of his paper here in this town. And so today, I just want to leave you with this, the words that, that Ben Bradley said in his farewell comment to you. He said, you are a complete newspaper man. You've done it all for this paper with commitment and grace. We thank you, and we love you, and we salute you. Ladies and gentlemen, Harry Rosenfeld. <laughs> Thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Again. <laughs> Great.